Okay. Uh, hi, everyone. Um, I guess it's time to start now, so let's get going. Uh, my name is Derek Gagno. I'm a software engineer from CoreOS. And so I used to be on the rocket team at CoreOS. So when I used to give talks like this, I would introduce myself as a rocket scientist. Uh, I can't exactly do that anymore because I'm not really on that team anymore. So uh, one of the pieces of technology I'll be talking about today is called Ignition. So I, I guess I can call myself a software arsonist. Um, anyway, I'm here to talk about using the config transpiler. And this talk is going to be focusing on provisioning on container Linux, and like the current state of the art of the tools. Uh, exactly what, what you use and how do you provision a container Linux machine. I'm going to go over all of the pieces of technology you'll need to interact with to go from a, like from scratch where you have nothing right now, to a fully provisioned and running container Linux machine that's hopefully doing something pretty cool and useful. And so uh, before I jump into it, a quick ex explanation about the next slide. I'm going to go give like a very like high level overview of like the flow of things, and then I'm going to step into each piece of technology and give a much more in-depth explanation. And so first you need to start out with creating a container Linux config. This is a configuration file written in YAML that describes exactly what and how a machine is supposed to do its job. Once you've written your container Linux config, you use the config transpiler, uh, which is a command line application, and the config transpiler will validate your config, make sure everything looks right, and then convert it into an ignition config. And you take this intermediate representation of an ignition config, and there is a component inside of container Linux that when it boots for the first time, uh, will go and actually provision the machine. And this is called ignition. So ignition will take that, you know, the thing that conf the config tra transpiler produced and go and do the hard work of setting up the disks, writing out files, creating users, and everything you need to actually have a working machine. So let's start off by talking about container Linux config. This is a YAML file uh, written by you that describes exactly what a machine is supposed to do. It has a lot of niceties built, in built into it and built into the schema to try to make it easy for you to manipulate and control pieces inside of container Linux. So just let's quickly go over kind of just the different things that you can do in a container Linux config to hopefully give you a better feel for you know, how you would use one or what you can do with it. Uh, so you can manipulate storage as one thing, and this includes like both like disks and partitions and file systems. So if your machine has a spare hard drive and in a uh, container Linux config, you can express, please repartition that, put butter FFS on it. But you can also write out and control files. So if you need to write out some configuration file for some application you're running, you can include the contents of that inline or specify go and fetch it from somewhere else. And you know it needs to be written out at this path with these permissions and so on. You can also manipulate the network. This is done via network D units. So in your container Linux config, you can include uh, directly inline just network D units to specify like I need a static you know, IP address in this interface or something like that. You can also manipulate system D units. So you can include new units for running. You can enable or mask existing units. You can also include drop-ins for existing units if you need to change some settings or otherwise modify them. And uh, you, can you can express all that, again, just in line in your YAML file here. Um, you can also manipulate and control users. So if you just want to like modify the core user, like set the password hash so you know what the password is, um, or even like in define an entire new set of users and groups, you can do that. Um, and then there's also a lot of uh, niceties for controlling different applications, like, uh, processes and things that run inside of container Linux. So like etcd, flannel, and docker, for example. You can just be like, I need to run flannel of this version with these settings, please make that happen. And you don't need to worry about how or exactly why what goes on there. And so once you've written this nice and complex con uh, container Linux config that has everything set up for your application, you then use the config transpiler to go in and actually, uh, specifically the config transpiler is responsible for two jobs, validation and conversion. So going over those in order, when I say validation, I don't mean just verifying that the YAML is correct. It'll also, where possible, look and make sure that what you've entered is uh, sane. So if you're specifying, hey, there's a file that needs to be fetched from this location and put on disk, it'll actually check that what you put in is actually a valid and parsable URL, otherwise it won't let it uh, proceed. Um, oh, and the, I meant to say this in the last slide, the config transpiler is a command line application with binaries available on GitHub for Windows, Mac, and Linux. Um, yeah, so validation. And it's important here that this is a command line application that's doing the validation instead of happening, uh, I guess, more out of band uh, of this flow, because this forces validation to happen outside of the boot process. Because you know, you if you write a container Linux config, you must use this command line tool to do this. Um, th there is no way for you to get around to doing validation before you try to bring up a machine. If you were to just directly give a container Linux config to a machine, like if that was how this technology was built. There, there's no way for us to force you to go and like use a validator, even if we provided it. And so with this, you can like if you just make a trivial two character, going to take you a couple seconds to fix. 
typo in your container Linux config, you can catch that immediately instead of handing it off to a machine because the change was trivial. Of course, I got it right. And then three minutes later, SSHD isn't coming online, and how do I get boot logs out of Amazon? Yeah, and so the other thing it's responsible for is conversion. And in this case, it's converting your container Linux config into an ignition config. An ignition config is a JSON file that includes a lot of the same information as you'll find in a container Linux config, but in a much more verbose and in some ses senses more distro agnostic way. Um, so like as an example, if you wanted to specify, hey, please run etcd, um, in your container Linux config, you just say, etcd with this version, here's some options. In your ignition config, you need to say, here is a systemd drop-in for the etcd-member.service unit. By the way, please enable that. And here I'm going to override these specific environment variables and change these settings over here. And there's a lot more moving pieces that the config transpiler can just understand and like manipulate for you. And one thing I really want to, I guess, stress with this talk is that uh, ignition configs, yes, they're JSON. Yes, I'm sure a bunch of you have written JSON configs before. But please don't write ignition configs. This is supposed to be just a um, back-end thing that you don't really need to concern yourself with. Uh, to steal an analogy from the compiler world, one way of thinking about this is that container Linux configs are really like the front end of the system. They're what you work in, they're what you like develop uh, your applicate, they're what the, you develop your machines in, they're what you work through problems in. And you use this tool, the transpiler, to convert the back end of the system, which is the ignition config. This is just an intermediate representation you don't need to worry or think about. You just take the, you know, the produced content and you hand it off to something to be interpreted, in this case, ignition. Um, and just kind of like also elaborate why, like you don't want to be writing these in JSON. Um, here is a just sample systemd unit. And th this is just a hello world unit. It, it, um, it's a one shot unit, so it just, uh, just going through this to qu quickly explain it. A one shot systemd unit expects the process to exit, and it just echoes out the string hello world. That's all this thing does. Just echoes hello world into the, into the uh, journal and exits. And there's an install section, so we can enable it on boot. Yeah, so if we have this and we want to include it in a JSON file, well, we need to do JSON string escaping. All of a sudden, this is becoming much harder for us as humans to work through and understand what's going on. And if you want to change this or manipulate it, it's much easier to make some mistake that you know is kind of trivial but hard to catch. And then you have to actually put it in the JSON if you want to use it. And so this uh, ignition config is a direct, uh, just copy paste out of the ignition docs, uh, is where this comes from. Yeah. So hopefully that kind of like illustrates why you don't want to just write ignition configs. Um, okay. So once you've written, or once you've gotten your ignition config out of the config transpiler, it's been validated, everything's good, you then give it off to ignition. And this is the component inside of container Linux. Uh, it runs on first boot before, uh, before disks are mounted, so before like most of the machine is uh, online. And it'll go and do the actual work of setting up the machine. It'll provision your disks for you, it'll write out systemd units, it'll write out files, create users, and so on and so on. And there's two kind of important things about ignition that I really want to point out to, to be able to make sure you guys have a better understanding of it. Uh, the first one is ignition only runs on the first boot. Uh, and this is really going with like an immutable hardware model. If you want to make some change to your container Linux config and you know, you know it's just like add another file or whatever, you need to, and you have a provisioned machine all that's already been set up with an old version of the config, you need to tear down that machine entirely and, and, create, an, and create a new one. If, if it's bare metal, that's just you know, reprovision the machine, re-image it. And this was a very conscious design decision because when we know the machine was booted in provision at this point in time, and that's all that's ever happened to it, it's much easier to understand what's happening with your hardware, what exactly your cluster is doing, than if you have a more incremental thing where it, it's booted at this point in time, then we applied these changes here, then we applied these changes here, then we applied these changes here. Now that's much harder to reason about and follow the process of what's happening. And so ignition is not configuration management. It just drops the files on the machine, and that's, that's what it does. And the other thing is that if ignition encounters an error, it will fail hard. And when I say hard, I mean that if an error is encountered, ignition will not let the machine continue to boot. Machine, ignition will either give you the exact machine that you asked for or no machine at all. Uh, so as an example, if in, your, uh, in the ignition config that ignition was given, it specifies that there should be two drives, please reformat both of them, put ext4 on them. When ignition runs, if one of those drives doesn't exist, it won't just proceed with only one of the drives. It'll flat out fail and not let the machine come up. Yeah, so that's ignition. And once ignition has run, it then produces your, the result is then you have your provision machine that's running and doing the things that you need. So let's go over some examples of common container Linux configs to hopefully uh, just kind of show you how these are used. So this is a, um, I actually use one like this a, a lot just in, in debugging. This is a container Linux config that just modifies the core user, which is the 
default user in container Linux for like logging in and manipulating the machine. So we have a top level past WD section and users under that. And so we're modifying uh, the core user, which is the name field there. We're setting the password hash to a known value. So we'll know what the password for the user is when we get in the machine, you know, be able to do things with that. And we can also specify an SSH key just for logging in with, you know, SSH keys. Here's a different example. This is a network D unit, so this is doing network configuration on some machine. We have a top level network D section, units underneath that. So we're gonna name this network D unit static.network and we can just inline include the entire contents of the network D unit, just in the, this is the same syntax that you would if you were you know, writing this directly on the machine. And so what this unit is doing specifically, it's setting a static IP address of 192.168.0.15 and a reasonable gateway for that and putting it on the interface ENP2 S0. So here's a little more beefy of an example. Um, this is setting up a single node etcd cluster. So I if you were to use this, you would, um, the machine would be running etcd just with, no with that single node being the one in the cluster and you could like, you know, do etcd operations with it. So there's a top level etcd section and once this is included in your container Linux config, it will automatically enable and use etcd on the system. And then so just looking at the first line, uh, we're specifying the name of the system to be curly braces host name. And so this is another feature of container Linux configs in that they're able to refer to data that is not known until the machine is created. In this case, it's the host name and the private IPv4 address of the machine. And this is particularly useful because it allows you to reuse container Linux configs across machines without having to hard code specific information about the machine into them. And then all the rest this config is doing is specifying that client connections should come in on port 2379, connections from other peers should come in on port 2380, and that the initial cluster is just a single uh, node of the, the one that is the current host name. So what if we had an invalid container Linux config? Uh, what this config is doing is just setting the update group to be in, the, in beta. So a container Linux config, if you're unaware, will automatically update itself, and you can subscribe to different uh, update groups. Uh, stable beta or alpha, it just influences like how quickly you get updates when they become available and you know how many other users have run through them to make sure there's no uh, you know potential problems in them. Um, so we want to set the group to beta here but we've accidentally typoed the word beta, it just hit the Q instead of the A in there. So if we actually try to run CT with this file, uh, also um, if I mentioned, meant to say this earlier, uh, CT is short for the config transpiler, so that's you know straightforward. Um, so if we run CT with um, that uh, invalid container Linux config, it'll actually print out a warning um, at line two, column three, saying that's an unknown update group. I don't know what that is. So it can catch and point out these problems to you. You know, and this is a trivial thing, takes us, you know, one character fix, now it says beta. And if we go and run this, CT will now actually produce that ignition config. Um, and in, in this case, it's just printing it out to standard out in that screenshot, but you can also have it write it out to a file. So let's um, take a closer look at um, actually using this stuff. Okay, if I can remember how my laptop works. Okay. Yeah, so I am um, just on a machine here and I have a container and Linux config here. And so all this uh, config is doing is it's adding a new uh, system D unit. And the name of the unit is hello.service. We're going to enable the unit so it'll run when the machine boots. And this is the exact same systemd unit that I walked through in the uh, ignition slides uh, just like a few minutes ago. So um, just quickly going through it, we're going to hello world unit. It just echoes out the string hello world into the journal. So I've got ct on the system. So if we do ct tech tech in file and we give it that container Linux config. And I'm going to do dash dash pretty so it'll format it in a way it's easier for us to see. And it prints, you know, it produces this ignition config for us, um, which is almost the same as what I had in the slides earlier, but there's a few extra just sections with empty curly brace objects in them. It'll, it'll do the same thing. So I'm going to run it again and have it produce out to a file hello.ign. We can see the contents are now in the file. So I have a script here, chorus production qmu.sh, and what this will do, it'll start up a local virtual machine, and if I pass the tag i flag, it'll pass in whatever file I provide uh, as an ignition file to the booting machine. So I boot this machine, uh, we'll see 
scrub go flying by. So what's happening right now is Ignition is fetching that container, uh, fetching that Ignition config. Uh, so Ignition can fetch a config from either a URL that you provide or just the user data in a whatever cloud provider you're in. In this case, it's fetching it from a URL that is being hosted by the script that I ran. So once we hit the login prompt, we know that Ignition has succeeded because we would not have been able to boot up to this point if there was a problem in the Ignition config. So if I just log into this machine, we should be able to run journal CTL identifier equals Ignition. And this will show us all of the boot logs uh, from the machine that's coming up uh, that have the Ignition identifier in them. So we can see that it uh, got the config and parsed it, which uh, is right there. It's the same uh, thing that I had in that file. And then if I can find my mouse. Well, you, you can see uh, it found the hello.service unit in, inside the ignition config. It then wrote out the unit and enabled it. So, it, so that it should have run. So now if we do system cuddle status hello.service, uh, we can see that the unit ran. Um, if you look at, I wish I knew where my mouse was right now. I can click on things. There we go. You can see that it ran successfully. Uh, exit was status zero. And it did uh, echo out the string, hello world. So yeah, we just took a container Linux config uh, that had a systemd unit in it, ran it through the config transpiler, which validated it for us, and then converted it into an ignition config. And we then used that ignition config to boot a actual virtual machine that you know did, did the things we specified in our container Linux config. There it is. So something that's worth pointing out, the way that I've explained this to you and like kind of walked you through this is very much the like manual way of booting a machine. Um, that's the wrong button. Wow. So I'm just trying to get my timer in front of me. Well, computers are hard. Um, if you wanted to boot and act, bring up an actual cluster of machines or a group of them, doing each one via this process where you have to pass it, you know, generate an ignition config for each one and pass it to each machine one by one is a rather like time consuming process. So I much, I very much recommend using some more aut automated tooling to do this. Uh, in this case, uh, something we built at CoreOS is called Matchbox that will do this for you. Uh, what Matchbox does specifically is brings up a uh, cluster of bare metal machines. So you can write container Linux configs for each one in there and it'll handle you know, running running through the transpiler and handing each uh, ignition config to the correct machine based on the configuration and so on. And there's a pretty good documentation up on the website if you want to read more about that. Um, yeah, so I was really hoping this talk would take a little bit longer, but so uh, if you want to read more about these technologies and container Linux configs and CT and ignition and so on, uh, a really good place to get started is the provisioning page in the container Linux documentation. You can get there, just go to chorus.com slash docs, uh, click on view all container Linux documentation, control F for provisioning, it'll be in there. Um, and the, both the config transpiler and ignition are up on GitHub at these URLs. Uh, you're welcome to look through the projects. There's more documentation in the repositories. Um, fi file issues, you find problems, obviously. Yeah, uh, that's what I do my talk. We're hiring, that's me. Uh, if you want to ask more questions about this, you can reach me at that email or Twitter or GitHub and any of those things. And yeah. Uh, anyone have any questions? Um, so, Ignition is going to replace, uh, fully replace cloud in it, right? I mean, yes. So, is that one going away anytime soon? Or? Uh, so, cloud in it, uh, just for, so everyone in the room has the history on this, um, is a component in container Linux that we've had pretty much since the OS like was created, and it was the way of provisioning. Your, your machines, you know, up, up until we made Ignition. And CloudNet is, it's in the operating system, but it is still used by enough legacy people and so many people that build systems around it, we can't just tear it out. Uh, it, and there will be a day where we will remove CloudNet from the uh, operating system, but that's still a very, like, far day away from here. And it'll be very noisy about blog posts and trying to notify people that this is happening. Thank you. Um, how e this, the question was, how easy, how easy is it to convert from CloudNet to container Linux configs. Um, there's a lot of, uh, the biggest problem is that CloudNet runs on every boot. So if you, if you look at your, um, like your, your uh, cloud config, it, it's not too hard to 
convert that into a container Linux config once you've read up on container Linux configs. Um, it also would probably be good for us to write a guide on doing that. But the, the bigger problem is you have to have a different workflow and that you can't write some config and then you know keep rebooting your machine and having different versions of it applied each time, if, if that makes sense. Yeah, so if you want to modify your container Linux config or Ignition config uh, and you reboot the machine, uh, nothing will happen because Ignition only runs on the first boot. We need, uh, this is a much more immutable model uh, where we don't encourage changing your machines like that. So yes, yeah, so you would have to just reprovision the machine, tear it down, make a new one. Yeah. Um, if you want to add user keys, there's, uh, and so if you're on some cloud provider, we have another utility called Chorus Metadata, and that is entirely independent from Ignition, and it will run and fetch user SSH keys and put them in place, and that'll happen every boot. So if your cloud provider provides a way to like specify different keys for the machine, uh, whenever you reboot, uh, Container Linux will pick up on that. So the question was, where does the machine get its ignition uh, config from? And so either, if you're booting under a metal, uh, you need to specify a URL to fetch it from. That can be like HTTP or TFTP or something like that. Um, if you're running in a cloud environment, you can either specify a URL or it can fetch it directly from the user data in, um, like in the cloud provider. So if, if you've ever, like on Amazon or Google or whatever, specified a cloud init or cloud config file, it, it works the same way. Uh, what about S3 bucket support? Uh, that is. Uh, S3 buckets is something I have code on my laptop that mostly adds support for. I need to test it slightly more. That'll probably be in the next release of Ignition. So I noticed in your etcd container Linux config example you had variable expansion. Was that CoreOS metadata variables or can those be passed in? Uh, you're talking about these? Yeah. Uh, yeah, those variables come directly from CoreOS metadata. Anyone have any other questions? The workflow with CT, do you actually see people using that to do the conversion or is it just local validation and then you push that into a uh, matchbox? Yeah, so if, you, if, if you're just booting a single machine, yes, I, I see people using this. Uh, we're also gonna get an online version of CT up at some point so you don't need to like grab this extra binary and put it on your system and the whole hassle. Um, if you're gonna bring up any like real uh, like e either like production workload or like group of machines, um, you're, you're, we really want you using instead using like Matchbox or Tectonic or something like that, uh, because for each single machine, you know, generating an, an, having an ignition config and passing each one to the right one and like knowing how to do that is much more of a hassle, and that should be something that's automated. And in that case, with something like Tectonic, I'm still writing container Linux config, but I'm doing it through their GUI, and then that behind the scenes converts it for Matchbox to consume. Yes. Yeah, at, at the end of the day, every machine consumes an Ignition config. And is Ignition config feature compatible with what uh, Cloud config has or Container Linux config? Um, ignition configs and the schema that they use uh, aims to be uh, much more independent from the operating system. So like in, in a CloudNet as an example, you could specify, yes, I want to be part of this update group. Uh, in Ignition configs, you need to specify, please write out this config file, this location with this, this string inside of it. So the we aim for container Linux configs to be feature compatible, like kind of have feature parity with cloud configs. Uh, Ignition configs will not, if that makes sense. Y you'll still be able to do everything. It'll be much more verbose and you need to like, yeah, you know, just understand. because the container Linux config is more abstracted away from what actual files on disk configure a service or something, correct? Yeah. Okay. Any other questions about provisioning or life or whatever? Cool, thanks everyone for coming. <laughs>